Hey there, I'm Joe Weems. Before we get into the video, I want to remind you about NGConf 2023 happening in Salt Lake City, Utah on June 14th and 15th. Head over to ngconf.org to check out the speakers, check out the talks, and to get your ticket before they all sell out. We'll see you there. As you can see, the whole slide deck is created by Jeff and Shadow together. Uh, let's see what the rest of the content is. I hope I will not be super surprised. Um, let's start. Since Ivy shipped, they enabled us for quite some cool things, and I will just mention a handful of component state management, per component change detection, or local change detection, as I would name it, non-blocking rendering, fine-grained reactivity, and full zoneless applications. Is it me? Okay, it's working. Um, from all of that stuff, I want to focus on the features that help us to not get more scalable or better architecture, but get faster and more performant Angular applications. And I want to focus on the part that is hardest to get, and this is runtime performance. To understand a little bit of what I tried to focus on, I will show you this next slide here, slide here where I highlight basically long tasks. This is one of the easiest things that you can spot in flame charts that will give you a first... Um, I hate microphones. Um, a first glimpse of what is bad or good. And now I have two things in both hands. That's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best, I do my best. Okay, um, the top shows a large-scale Angular application, natively, like no changes, nothing, and the lower image shows you how the flame charts, how the work could be reduced if you tweak it a little bit and if you go zoneless, at least for the parts that are executed here. So it's not the full application that is zoneless, it's only a part but you can already see the drastic improvement. Um, how can we go there? What is a big problem? It is a lot of effort to go fully zoneless with application. You can see that a small pet project takes a little bit of effort to go zoneless. You can get a, a fully zoneless that you write from scratch if it is not too big, but if you have an already existing application that is in some scale, you will not manage to go fully zoneless with this application. It is way too much effort and way too hard to do it. <laughs> To tackle that problem and still have some options to improve the performance, I created a tool set to help us to get that faster done. And the tool set that we need is named Rx Angular. It is an open source repository that focuses on performance and developer experience. And I want to show you small pieces of this library that you can use to take an Angular application partially zoneless. To go there, I want to quickly introduce you to how change detection and zone is connected to that stuff so that we understand what we want to get rid of. So change detection in this slide deck is divided into the topic component tree, dirty marking, and rendering. So let's start with the component tree. Your application, your Angular application, consists out of different components. And here I marked all the components with a red box and I named them. And if you take this structure and you look at it how Angular treats it, it is a tree structure. It is a tree structure out of components. And at the very top, this blue box that you see is the application reference that holds all the components uh, of this tree. So, if you interact with one of those components, and this assumption here that every single component has change detection on push enabled, so it's a pretty good case, and you interact with one of those components, a process is started that is called dirty marking, where you, from the very component that you interacted up to the top, mark all the components 
with a flag that tells Angular that if there is a re-rendering, those components with the red triangle needs to get redrawn, re-rendered, re-evaluated. And this is everything Angular does, nothing else. In a second process, step Zone kicks in, Zone realizes that somebody interacted with an asynchronous API. It could be a set timeout. In this uh, case here, it is an event listener. And then Zone tells Angular after some time that Angular should call a method that is called applicationref.tick. And this method basically re-renders the full component tree. So rendering is basically when we turn a light green box into a dark green box. And here we see that the triangles have different colors. So if a triangle is dark, black, uh, it means that there was no change to the input binding and that the change detection strategy on push was evaluating in a way where it says, I don't need to re-evaluate, re-render those components. But all the other components with a red triangle are re-rendered. And if you have a little bit more look on that, you will realize that there is way too much that we need to re-render. In fact, we only want to update one tiny piece of the HTML template in the component that is clicked, but we have to re-evaluate and re-render the full tree from the bottom up to the top. And this is basically the concept momentum model that we have to deal with, a bottom-up triggered by Angular, dirty marking, and a top-down re-rendering that is triggered by Zone. And this is very slow. So quickly, how does Zone realize that it needs to call application ref tick? Every single API is patched by Zone. And if you compare change detection mechanisms with other frameworks, you will see that Angular is very different at the moment. Because every other framework has an explicit state management, explicit change detection, and Angular is implicitly. So I always say Angular does a wild guess for re-rendering because it does not really know if there is a change, it's just a guess. A guess that is most probably very accurate. So a little bit on um, how the APIs are patched. Uh, we have a lot of native browser APIs that are asynchronous and all asynchronous APIs are um, copied by this mechanism and wrapped with a little bit of custom logic, and this is the patching mechanism. Uh, and you can see here in this uh, code snippet how it roughly could work. You can basically take the prototype, uh, in this case of the add event listener function, you store that function, you create your own wrapper, sneak in your code, and then you execute the original method. And this is what Zone does with every single API that it finds in the browser. And after Zone executed, your browser is basically a different uh, environment. It is a patched environment, which is not always super helpful. Um, there is a list. This is only a slight list of what APIs are possible. The link down here shows you the scary full list of all APIs that are patched. Uh, and here is uh, one of the last code snippets that I want to show for Zone. This is in the application reference. And there we have a method that is called on microtask empty. And this is basically fired when Zone realizes that all our asynchronous interactions are done. And after that uh, queue is empty, Angular calls application ref tick and re-renders the full component tree. And this is how at the moment, change detection and rendering works in Angular. Um, I can open up a quick demo, and I can show you that every number that you can see here, I hope they are big enough, will increase if I click any of those buttons. And this basically shows us that we go bottom up, top down. And what I want to pitch to you is a new way of change detection that is not bottom up, top down, but this will bring us a little bit more performance. And to do that, I need to introduce a couple of tools. What I need to introduce the new way of change detection is local state management and rendering, and I will do that with special directives in the template because this is the most efficient way where you can introduce those change detection logic. 
So first, let's start with my state management part. Um, why do I need that? If zone is not triggering my change detection, somebody else needs to do it. And in this case, our explicit state management will do it. And our previous speaker, Pavel, is at the moment working on uh, a similar thing, explicit change detection uh, in, on component level. And I'm extremely excited that I have the honor to be his uh, follow-up talk. What I did is a little bit of a different setup. Uh, my change detection mechanism is fully lazy. The other one is more eager. And I have two layers. I have one layer that interacts with reactive APIs, which are promises and everything that is asynchronous. And then and, uh, at the lower level, I have set and get. This is imperative code. <clears throat> and I need that to basically mix and match asynchronous and synchronous code pieces. Uh, this is another visualization of how I separate them. And in another demo, I can quickly show you how code pieces could look like that leverage this new technique. Unfortunately, I have this microphone now. No, don't, don't worry. Like, oh, yeah, this is what I need. Thanks. OK. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I'm a good mic holder. Okie dokie. So, um, I have in this class here um, added some methods, and one of the most important and fanciest methods that I want to quickly show is the connect method. Everything else is more or less familiar for you, I believe, so I will focus on the fancy stuff. And imagine I have a object that I want to manage, and this object has a property that is called genres, movie genres. And here I have a observable that uh, receives, uh, that returns me a, a observable or a promise from an HTTP request. And I cannot just take that HTTP request and directly connect it to that uh, property. And this one line makes sure that subscription handling is set up properly and a single change from a promise or multiple changes from uh, observables are applied. This is updating one single property. Here at the bottom, if I remove that line here to have an easier readable code. Uh, I can also apply multiple properties. So here I apply multiple key value pairs from my router state to my state management. And if I want to do something really fancy, I can also say I want to apply a custom method. For example, I can take the old state and the new value, and then I can run my transformation on my own. Use a T14. Uh, what? <laughs> Snippet. OK, T14, yeah. So um, this is basically just a quick demo on how short the lines uh, are and what you need to do to connect multiple changes to your uh, component state management. Uh, if you want to know more about the state management part, you should watch for other talks. In this talk, I want to focus more on the rendering part, and I have only seven minutes left, so I really have to hurry now. Um, in my presentation, the next topic is template rendering, and this is very exciting. Um, this is a component tree, minimal component tree. And what we see here is all components are on push. And in the last component, I use the async pipe to render it. And what we see here as dark green is the stuff that I really want to update. And what we see as yellow here is the stuff that I reevaluate unnecessary. So all the yellow stuff is useless work. It's a lot. So a first step that I introduced to go away from this zone full change detection mechanism is uh, I introduced a pipe that is called the push pipe. This principle, this concept is not my own idea. It is a very old idea. It's uh, pitched 2015 from Rob Walmart. He's not in the team anymore. And this was my first attempt. And you see there is already way less work done. Uh, but we took it one step further, and we introduced a structural directive. And with structural directives, as you can see, we are able to only update one specific HTML snippet in your whole component template. This is the smallest piece of work that you can 
uh, reduce your change detection too, and it is the most performant way that we um, figured out so far. If you compare it to um, an application that has change detection on push and the async pipe on the left side, you see there is a drastic difference. And if you have a closer look, the two circles here on the right mean that we also handle multiple synchronous changes in a row in a very performant way. And this is uh, quite exciting. Um, I can quickly demonstrate to you how those directives can be applied. And um, I will not use Shai's hand now. I will jump in directly and show you. Ah, okay. I will use a hand. Ah, okay. So, um, normally people would apply the ng if hack. And then this promise or observable. And then they would say ng if uh, as. I can make the code bigger in a second, yes. Just for you, not for the audience. Here we go. Beautiful. So this is what people normally do. It has a lot of flaws. It will not handle false values very well. So for um, introducing a new directive to handle this, we created the rxlet directive. And the new syntax for it looks like this. And in that way, we have the same thing just without hex as the uh, um, ngif hack. And what I can do now is I can remove the async pipe and as we are fully lazy, I can also remove the question marks because this template snippet will not get rendered if there is no value here. Um, I also have another directive that is called rx if here I basically just remove the async pipe there. And I have another structural directive that is called rx4. And I could put it here. And this is all the refactoring that I need to um, move the templates that I touched now into a zone-less state. So this is already running outside of zone with all those changes, and the changes are very little. Um, By the way, did you are you going to ask them for help in the documentation side? I will do that later. Okay, just for a minute. I quickly can demonstrate how um, it looks. So uh, on the left button. I increase every single number in that template, which means every single binding is re-evaluated. And when I click the right button, you see that only this number here increases, which means I really focus on the one embedded view and not the full template anymore. Um, this was local rendering. And now, as I have two minutes left, I have to hurry a little bit. Uh, and now it is about rendering and chunk rendering. This is the most exciting thing. Um, normally, Angular executes the blue boxes work all at once, and it has no notion of the frame budget and no knowledge about if it produces blocked frozen UI or not. So what we introduced is something that is called concurrent Angular or, the co or concurrent rendering. We basically borrowed some ideas from the React uh, team. And this enables us to have a scheduling and change detection mechanism with the notion of the frame budget. So whenever we see that the time uh, passed too much and we are close to a long task, we stop work and we reschedule the rest of the work in the next task. This will, of course, take a little bit longer, but we can ensure without any knowledge of the developer that there are no frame drops produced. This is really exciting. And I can show you uh, ng4 as it is written in Angular and all the red squiggles that you see are long tasks. And in comparison, our concurrent rendering, uh, here you see flame charts, looks like this. It is not a single frame drop present. And if you look at the interval phase here, it is nearly no work done. So this is quite exciting. And it also helps us to have very smooth interactions. And those very smooth interactions are also very easy to demo. Um, I have a list of some items here. And if I navigate to this native thing, you see the animation is frozen. The ripple effect of Angular material uh, stopped. And all the animation is also locked. If I navigate now to this concurrent button, you will see it is immediately navigating there and back. So if I do the same quick movement on the native part, you see 
it is not really working. And if I go to the concurrent stuff, it is immediately showing me a result. This is quite impressive because the lines that you need to change in your code base are two characters. Quite cool. Uh, and you have that improvements. I have 20 seconds left. And therefore, I will pitch to you that you can also go fully zoneless if you enabled, uh, if you managed to get rid of every single async pipe in your template and use our directives, you can basically kick out zone. You can first of all make a recording, make sure that you see zone.js here. It's mostly pretty e easiest to spot in the timing marks where you can see all the different APIs that are patched. Uh, and this, of course, as we know, is a very slow thing, what you can do is you can then disable zone, kick it out, remove the imports, and the only stuff that you need to do is you need to care about the router. At the moment, the router relies heavily on zone.js and it will not really work if you remove zone. So therefore, you have to run change detection on every router and navigation on your own. But it is a one-liner, and if you introduce that one-liner, you are also able to run the application fully zoneless. And that you really believe me, I will use the last minus 50 seconds <laughs> <laughs> to check out a version in my code base and run that thing fully zoneless. No, yes, maybe. Yeah? Help you. Okay. Thank Get you. out of the <laughs> Where is all the stuff that I need? Hmm. Yeah. Format your hard drive. Ah, it's the wrong project. Okay. Give me one second. Ta -da -ta -da -ta -ta. Here we go. There we go. Remove zone.js. I checked it out. Hard. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yes. And then I will show you that I'm very clumsy in using my mouse. But here, polyfills zone is commented out, it's not present. Main TS, it's no operation zone. And if I click on my application again, the Movies app, and I refresh it, we should see that it still works. And it is completely zoneless. I can also show you quickly some comparison measurements. So the measurement down here with all the red squiggles at the end is basically a zone full application. This one has nearly no squiggles in the middle here. This is the part that I optimized with all my code changes, and it's pretty cool. And you can see all that areas here has not a single red task, long task. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>